Always live and always wild. Hi everyone and welcome to the Africam show. We're starting off with a bang here at Tao. I love going across the different cams and just watching the way the landscape is changing at the moment because we're at this really critical point. But we'll get into that in a moment. Firstly, welcome everybody. Remember that we're live and interactive so you can send through questions and comments and you know the drill. You can tell me how you're enjoying the Africam show this afternoon what you're looking forward to seeing. You can tell me what has been your favorite cam over the last week. We haven't chatted since Thursday, I think. Yes, Thursday. So tell me what, you're, what you've been enjoying, what you want to see, all those wonderful things. I'm here to, to answer any questions that you have, any comments that you'd like discussed, pretty much anything. I'm here to be part of the AfriCam community, yes. And uh, starting off with some lovely birds as well. And we have a whole lot of hellos. And that's because, like I said, we're live and interactive. And if you're new to the stream, if this is the first time that you're joining us, please do send us a hello. We love to hear about new faces and, and names on the AfriCam or part of the AfriCam community. So please do send a hello as well. Amber Co, you say happy Tuesday to all. Whenever I see Happy Tuesday to all, I know it's you, Amber Co. You say, coffee and chocolate muffin ready and excited for today's show. And a huge thank you to all that make these shows possible. Thank you, Amber Co., for always showing up for us. Dear NC, you say, good morning from Seattle. You're excited to be here and you're ready with your coffee. Very nice. I, I just have water today. Not that I usually have anything more interesting, apart from tea. But... Still, very nice, dear NC. Casper's third ghost is in the house. You say good day, Trish, and everyone from Milwaukee. Hot lemon ginger tea today. Oh, yes, I could do with some of that. And then Zygote, you say namaste, namaste to you too, Zygote. And Rolling Trouble is, is in the house too. I was about to say it's rolled in, but I'm sure you've heard that tons of times. You say hello from Washington with coffee and water here. Nice. And then Zygote, you say, sunrise at Campus Dam and evening at Old Donio has been awesome. Well, I can tell you across the board, in most of the camps that I've looked at, even where I am right now, I'm in the bush. And um, it's the sunsets and the sunrises have been spectacular. April Al, you say, good morning, everyone from a sunny Connecticut. You're looking forward to the show, aren't we all? Kauru, you say, hi, Trishala. Hi, Kauru. And Mr. H, UAE 87, you say, today you have some juice. Uh, I've got some internal juice today. I had a whole lot of energy to start off. Uh, and then I kind of plummeted. But you know what? Every single time I get to spend time with all of you, uh, so on Tuesdays and Thursdays, when I get to spend this time with you, whether it's for the Africam show or Wild Moments, even if I'm tired, you know that 3.30-itis, even if I'm tired, once I'm done, I feel so good. I could just conquer the world. And if anything, I'd love for all of the viewers to feel just as good after we spend this time together. Not even the time that we spend together, but even after you've just spent time on your own, even looking at the different cameras, because you get to, you know, immerse yourself in wildlife for a little bit. And that is the best part about spending this time together. Now here at Tao, you can see things are getting, getting nice and and dry slowly but surely you can check it's very muddy very very muddy we've got some blacksmith lapwings we've got uh, looks like a oh, goodness i was about to say a rob knobbed coot <laughs> a red knobbed coot not a rob knobbed coot looks like we had a few goslings as well a little earlier are they going to make as much, or, oh goodness, I couldn't speak there. They're going to make the best of the water that's available at the moment. Thankfully, and we spoke about this earlier, that at Tal, the rains seem to come a little bit later than the rest of the, the cameras or where the rest of the cameras are positioned. 
And so we're hoping that the dams stay or the pans stay fuller for longer. And that, of course, means that we can have a lot more visitors. Now, the majority of, of water holes that are placed in front of lodges are usually man-made. If you see a dam wall, that usually implies that it's man-made. And so we, in a way, are constantly you know, adjusting the environment and making changes. Uh, it's just that when it comes to water, it feels like a lot more pleasant of a change. And I can guarantee that the animals are probably very happy about that, uh, the availability of water. Now, we're up in East Africa at Aldonio, we had some antelope just a little couple moments ago. I think they moved off to the right there. Just saw the tail end of it. But imagine um, an earlier time, a couple thousand years ago, where pretty much all the animals that we know right now still exist but civilization human civilization to the extent that it exists right now doesn't exist so just imagine that in that kind of area there's still going to be places where there's rainfall places where there aren't places where there's permanent water sources places that are ephemeral pans so seasonal pans they fill up during the wet season and they dry up in the dry season so you can imagine that many animals that are water dependent are going to be moving through, constantly almost migrating. Um, and those migratory channels kind of don't really exist in southern Africa anymore. I'm talking about terrestrial animals, or I should rather say land-dwelling animals, so not birds. Oh, we've got some red-billed oxpeckers all having a drink here. Aren't you fun? They are a lot of fun, these guys. But so what I'm saying is that without fences, without roads and things like that, there would have been a lot more migration, lots more movement in order to follow resources. But now, I suppose as um, as a way to make up in a, in a weird way, to make up for all of the, the changes we have made to the environment, adding a waterhole. I'm not against it. Now it looks like we have a pintail wider there with a nice long tail. And now they've all flown away, of course. Oh, I still see it down the bottom there. You can just kind of see that long, long cumbersome tail popping up every now and then. I've been very lucky that in my garden at home I get pintail white eyes coming through. Now they do have quite a red beak that I can't see very clearly right now and it's the male that has the that has this nice nice long tail. Oh, I'd love to spend some time with some birds and a whole lot of butterflies and the impala in the background. Is this not just a really pretty scene? I think so. But as that impala starts to kind of put its head down and avoid us, how about we come back down to southern Africa and pay a visit to Tembi because there's some impala there too and a lot of them. There we go. Oh, look at all of them chilling. Love to see impalas just taking it easy because so often that's not the way we see them. Mindy Tillapau, you say, hey, Trishala, always a pleasure to hear your voice. Thank you, Mindy. It's always a pleasure to see your name. Thank you so much for jumping on board. You know, today I was thinking about um, what I'd like to discuss with all of you. And I couldn't think of anything. Normally inspiration strikes sometime during the day. Something just catches my attention. And today I I didn't, I don't know. Nothing sort of caught my attention. Recently I've been spending a lot of time um, just learning about early earth. 
and impalas are one of those animals that have stuck around for a long time. There's actually some nyala at the back there as well. But impala have pretty much been in the form that we see here in front of us for the last six million years or so. Uh, that's, a, that's a feat relatively unchanged. So the impala that we see right here is pretty much the same as a fossilized impala from about six million years ago. But learning about the history of the planet or the history of life on the planet is a, is a big task. You know, there's just couple billion years to cover, that's all. But nonetheless, it is a valuable one. Ooh. Oh yes. Thank you, Laura. Laura, you're sending it through. I love to get a long thing like this because I was just saying to you, you know, inspiration didn't strike and I was feeling very relaxed and I was just enjoying the bush and I thought maybe I'd just let you all enjoy the sights and the sounds and let your questions come through. But Laura has sent a long one. I haven't read it yet, so I'm going to read it with you. You say, Hi, Trishala. I'm copying and pasting my question from last Thursday in case I missed it, but you wanted to put it here just in case, and you don't want to forget. It's always a good idea, Laura. Uh, you say, Today, about four or five hours back at Tao, a rather large dust devil blew across the field and right over a giraffe. As it passed the giraffe, Oh, as it passed, the giraffe was gone, and it's hard to tell if it just decided to run with it or what. That's very, very interesting. Laura, I'm going to get to your, the bottom part of your question now. I'm just going to let everyone know we're back over at Tal, watching some ZBs. Very nice. So this is the, the location that Laura is talking about where she saw that, um, that dust devil, which is basically a, a whirlwind. So your question is, would a strong dust devil be able to lift or sweep up a giraffe? Um, super interesting sight that I've never seen. Would it be a great, <laughs> oh, it would be a great wild moment capture. That's really interesting. You know what, Laura, if you have that clip, please do send it to me. Uh, if not, I'm sure that Kirst will be able to locate that particular thing that particular clip and send it to me too because I would love to see because we've also got to remember that obviously it looked like the giraffe was doing a bit of a vanishing act but it could also have been the greatest moment in the camera's glitch history and it just so happened to miss a frame or something like that but I would love to have a look. Uh, talking about the ability of a strong wind to be able to pick up an animal um, it's not impossible because basically the, the force of the wind needs to overcome the mass of the animal. Um, and force, mass, acceleration, all those things are related. But it is very unlikely that a dust devil would be able to lift a giraffe. Um, I mean, I, I know that that's... A, you weren't thinking, oh, the giraffe got lifted up by the dust devil. But say, okay, so a giraffe is, is about 1.2 tons, so maybe 1,200 kgs for a male, slightly lighter for a female, about 800 kgs or so. So that's never, the dust devil's never going to be able to create enough mass to be able to pick up that animal. But what if it was a smaller animal? What if it was a gerbil? or a penguin. Sorry, penguin just came to mind. <laughs> um, still, I don't think it would be able to pick them up. But a dust devil is like, kind of like a mini tornado, right? But a, but a tornado has far more energy in the system than a dust devil. I mean, even if you stand in a dust devil, you can kind of collapse it immediately just because you're blocking um, the vortex the flow of the air. But I think that's a really interesting observation. I'd love to have a look at my uh, have a look myself. Thank you, Laura. And I'm sure that you will <laughs> you will send it through to me. 
those are those types of questions are really interesting because what I love most about what we're able to do as naturalists, as guides, as scientists, um, as a, even as presenters, somebody who communicates the the information to others. What I love about it is we we can never just be in isolation. It can never just be the biology of an animal or just be the chemistry of an animal. Sometimes we need to think about the physics. Um, the, just the laws of the natural world in terms of physics as well and how they apply to the animals around us. Um, and I love that. I love that so much. And so when you ask questions like this, it, um, it really pulls me back into that very special place. Mary Momo, you say, hello all from Hot Springs, Arkansas. You're rolling in late today. No worries, Mary Momo. We're just always glad for you to be on board. Jean Gale, you say, oops, late again, but hello all. No worries, there's some seats in the back. We're just glad that you all can jump on board. Hi, Mindy. Mindy, you say, what are my thoughts, or if I have any thoughts, on why antelope have permanent horns while deer species shed their antlers? That is an interesting question, and you know what? So I have a few thoughts just right now chatting about this question, but on Thursday, on the 21st, during Wild Moments, we're going to have Mike Fitz back on. And um, Mike Fitz is a naturalist and an expert with, with North American wildlife. And I think that would be an excellent question to kind of chat with him about. So antlers are temporary structures uh, that are grown during the mating season, where horns are permanent structures. They're attached to the head, to the bone. Now, I wonder if it's mm, thinking out loud here. So, I wonder if horns and antlers are a result of convergent evolution. Because remember that antelopes are bovidae. Um, that's the that's the antelope family, while deers are, are cervidae. So they're in completely different families, even though they pretty much fill the same niche across the southern hemisphere versus the northern hemisphere. So I wonder if the development of antlers is something that is a result of convergent evolution, um, in which case, Mindy, your question doesn't, well then it's not really a question anymore because they're completely different. So um, I'm just thinking out, out loud here, but then why wouldn't, why wouldn't deer or cervidae need to keep their horns? Ah, oh, Mindy, you've done it again. You've done it again and I love it. Mindy has a habit of sending me questions that just pick my brain and then I have to remember that actually I'm doing a show with people here and I can't just ramble on like a mad scientist slash guide <laughs> which is which is I suppose fine also anyway we are uh, thank you very much Kirst for this um, very appropriate move we're back looking at some uh, oh, looks like a bushbuck are you a bushbuck look like a little bushbuck or a little nyala Oh, we're getting some really cool questions coming in. <laughs> Kauru. This is an awesome question, and I'll tell you why. Because I recently just read about this. Can you believe it? So Kauru wanted to know, why do small and some medium birds only hop while other medium-sized and bigger, bigger birds walk? This is so interesting. So, birds will either hop or walk, but they will not do both. Uh, when I say hop or walk, I mean as a form of movement. You know, a, scaring a big bird and it hops, I mean, that's more of a jump, right? But they will not do both. Penguins are an outlier because penguins are very large, so their hops allow them to get by further. But, for a small bird, the energy they can expend hopping is easier than the energy they can expend um, walking, or is less expensive than walking. 
and also because they are so light. Um, but also on top of that, the, they have kind of um, anatomically have um, what is what is that part of their body? Basically, anatomically, it's easier for them to hop than it is to walk. For larger birds, it is easier for them to walk than it is to hop. And basically, it all relates to weight and energy. There's a, a sort of sweet spot. And the reason that penguins go out of that sweet spot and being larger birds that do hop, that's because their bodies are pretty much like a pendulum. So by hopping, they're using very little energy, but also they're covering a greater distance than a smaller bird that hops. I love it. I love it because there's no definitive answer. We can only make um, assumptions based on what we see, knowing and going back to physics and you know the laws of the natural world. We know that energy is very important for animals, and we know that the way that they use it is can mean death or survival. So they have to be really, really, really attuned. Um, I don't mean consciously, but evolutionary-wise, they've got to be really attuned to what is the most effective way to do something. And Kauru, now you've got me thinking. Because I just read about it briefly, um, and I wanted to deep dive into it as well. If I remember anything else, I'll let you know, Karu. Uh, now that we have a closer look here, you can see that these are definitely little bushbuck. Now, bushbuck are, are actually, I think that I am spoiled. So when you stay in a camp in a bush, you can be quite spoiled with bushbuck because they tend to seek refuge around camps. But out, if I go out on safari, I hardly see them. But that is also a result of their habitat. Bushbuck prefer um, dense areas. So even if they are there, you might not see them. Seeing them out in the open is very cool. April, Al, you say that yesterday you noticed adult elephants using their using their trunk. You notice that adult elephants using their trunk to pull their calves back from uh, muddy banks as they were preparing to leave the area. <gasps> That's really, really cool. And it makes total sense because uh, we've talked about this before. At this time of the year, things can get really muddy around water holes. And we know that you know, elephants slip in. I mean, earlier when we were at Tal, we saw the zebra kind of take a little bit of a you know, slippery, slidey ride on the one hoof. And I think it's, um, it's a, such a tender moment to have witnessed April Owl because it, it, shows, it shows so many things, actually. It shows memory. It shows... Uh, recognition of the the calves body space where it could be going it it shows um, some kind of control over the the calf you know understanding of the of the parent child bond but it also shows an, ab uh, an ability to anticipate something so something that has not happened in the past or perhaps not have happened in the past, um, maybe not has happened recently, maybe it could not have happened to the calf yet, but it shows some kind of anticipation, preparation for a potential hazard, which I think is really cool. Ooh, Kirst has thrown a spanner in the works. Uh, oh, is it Kirst? Or and I'm not. I've sent a link, but um, I'm not sure if this is the name of a of a of an author on a paper, or this is just Arlene's name. Hi, Arlene. There we go. Um, Arlene, you say that cakers 
I'm probably saying that terribly wrong. A medium parrot hops and walks. That's interesting. In fact, now that you say that, parrots in general do seem to hop and walk. But when they walk, they can look quite awkward. Now, I wonder if uh, biologically there's a definition for walking that includes movement of the hips, not just how long your feet are off the ground. We'll have, we'll have to dig deep. Karu, look what you've done. Um, rolling trouble, you say, woohoo, 21st is your birthday. What a gift that will be. I'm going to remember that it's your birthday on the 21st. Rolling trouble. And a happy birthday during wild moments with Mike Fitz. Jai Bunny, you say hello. And Kaori, you say thanks for ask, answering your question. It was interesting. It is interesting. Um, unfortunately, it's not a definitive answer, but so few things are. But it's a really interesting discussion. And now that Arlene L has thrown this other spanner into my brain about parrots, it's going to be deep dive time. Deep dive for Kaoru and and. Arlene and uh, Deep Type for Mindy as well. Anyway, now my brain is is very much outside Tao <laughs> and what we're looking at, at uh, on the screen. Shame, I've neglected what we've been looking at on the screen for a while. Um, but please continue to send through your questions and your comments. You know how I love it. I love to think out aloud with all of you. You're very valuable sounding boards for biological concepts and ideas. I love it. Anyway, now we have some zebra coming down. I wonder, um, April Al, you were talking about the fact that you saw this tender moment between a mother and a calf, elephant mother and calf, and the mother trying to like pull the calf away from the water's edge. Oh, or the muddy banks. I wonder if it was a Tao. Tao is a culprit for that kind of thing. You can actually see as the hooves move into the mud, they're sinking down. And it's making the zebras think twice. Because if the zebra does get stuck in the water, in that mud, we know that there's crocodiles at Tal, and they know that too. Now the last thing they'd want is to be easy pickings for a crocodile. I'd love to see what their next move is going to be though. They're standing so still, you might even think the camera is stuck, but it's not. There's this fine line between needing water and getting to the water and how much you're willing to go risk-wise to actually get it. Everyone needs water to exist um, and water comes with dangers too. Oh, trying desperately to touch its, its muzzle to the water but just can't make it. It's obviously... Ooh, this is really interesting. Oh, almost doing a giraffe um, giraffe pose there to get to the water. Come round this side where it's a little drier. Still not managing. Maybe this one on the right will be a little bit... Um, I wouldn't want to say smarter about it. So I don't think they're not smart. Something Sometimes what we can see compared to what they can see can be very different. Anyway, the zebra has decided that it's going to risk it for the biscuit and it's into the mud. I wonder, have any of you seen the style here at at Tao taking down large prey. I can't recall seeing it myself. But being stuck in the mud is really... you don't want to be stuck in the mud. 
never want to be stuck in the mud. Come on, follow your friend. Oh, there we go. Kirst has just said that they have, or you have seen a croc try with a water buck once. I feel like every time I look at this camera and we're looking at the crocodiles, um, they're, they're just chilling, which is also fine. Amber Coe, you say at Rosie's Pan, there was a large herd of Cape Buffalo, and within the calves, um, within the herd, there were some very young calves. When the herd was leaving, one of the young calves decided to rest, and several cows and a bull stayed behind. Is this typical behavior? You've usually seen that the cow will stay behind with the calf. Um, I can't say that I've seen that before. Uh, uh, buffaloes, when they move, obviously, you know, herds are huge. What they tend to have are these individuals called pathfinders. And these are individuals that will lead the group in certain ways. So kind of imagine them as a committee. So when the committee decides, we're going to go this way, um, then everyone gets up and, and trusts the committee. So I wonder if perhaps one of those pathfinders, maybe it was one of uh, her calves, and that's why she decided to stay. And remember, this is not a, it's not a hierarchical thing. Um, there isn't really a dominance hierarchy within the females in a buffalo herd. They is one subtly within the males, but there's, there's, you'll always see who the dominant males are. But with, amongst the females, there's not really a whole lot of hierarchical um, changes going on. Oh, oh, you're suckling. That is so sweet. And there's more zebras coming down too. So Amber Cole, I can tell you I haven't seen that kind of behavior before. I've seen um, oh, maybe I have. Not for very, very young calves. But I have seen calves where they're not, they're not terribly young, but they're still brown. And they'll kind of be um, lagging. And there will be other members of the herd that will, you know, hang around too. And I think that the herd mentality is very strong. They're not going to say, they're not going to leave behind a calf. Definitely not. They're going to stick around, and it's really up to the calf's mother to be able to say, come on, let's go. So perhaps what, we were, what you were observing at Rosie's Pan was the calf's mother coming back and everyone else kind of like going, oh, now we've got to stick around until she can, she can convince her calf to follow along too but they would never leave that calf behind. As usual, I stand to be corrected because I just realized I used the word never, which is seldom used when it comes to explaining animal behavior and biology. Nice little array here. Some guinea fowl, the impala earlier, zebra. I thought I saw an elephant. Ah, there we go. Hello, Ellie. Oh, I do love them. I was um, thinking about elephant communication recently. And we know that elephants can communicate infrasonically, so that's below the threshold we can hear. So we can hear from about 20 hertz to about 20,000 hertz. Elephants can create rumbles down to about 13 hertz. I know it doesn't sound like way below our hearing threshold, but it is. Uh, so anyway, I decided, so uh, I'm going to admit something here. I, I seem to be very bad at hearing lions at a distance. And I know, I mean, I don't know how I know, but I had a feeling that there must be, because the lion's roar travels so far and contact calls travel so, so far, there must be a portion 
of a lion's roar that must also be infrasonic below our hearing threshold. Anyway, then I went on a deep dive figuring out what I could hear and what 20 hertz sounds like um, because theoretically it should be within my hearing threshold. I urge you to go ahead and listen if you can find an audio clip of what 20 hertz sounds like. I could barely hear it. Barely hear it. So anything below that is can I, I won't be able to pick up at all. And that's the level at which a lot of elephant communication is happening. Now a lion's roar at the lower end of the spectrum, the lower end of the frequency spectrum that is, it's about uh, about 40 hertz. But the other portions of it we are able to hear, no problem, as you know. It's very interesting to think about um, us having the same, when I say us, I mean all mammals, having the same body parts. We've all got ears. Uh, I wonder if you heard that. I'm still in the bush at the moment and there's a, an elephant just screeched not very far from me. <laughs> so we all, we, have, we all have ears, um, uh, we all have mouths, we have noses, we have eyes, we, all these things that give us a sense of our world. But how different they can be. When I think about a vision in animals, and I think about, well, you know, I've always really loved vision. But uh, then I started to do this, this deep dive into hearing, what we can hear, and what is this world that we can't hear, that it clearly exists, and exists loudly, I might add. Ooh. That was a very Wes Anderson scene right there. <laughs> and you can see exactly where they ran off from. They left a dust cloud there. But we have these worlds that are really, we are completely oblivious to. Because it's not, it's not necessary for our survival. But it's so interesting. It's so, so interesting. So those frequencies that we can't hear that are below our hearing threshold, frequency of sound is not related to the volume of sound. So those low frequencies can be soft. They can be very loud. Um, and those uh, low rumbles that we hear from elephants, even though we can't hear it at all, we might be able to feel it. You might be able to feel this um, this movement in the air almost, like a, like a thundery feeling in the air. But we might not be able to hear it, but it is loud. It's the equivalent of being at a, at a, at a rock concert or at a construction site. And I find it utterly fascinating. And the, our sensory needs, mammalian sensory needs, changes across all different kinds of animals. Now if you imagine a zebra, zebras spend the majority of their time in open areas. What is the necessity for them to have large ears? Not very much at all. There's nothing. Plus, they live in a herd, and they don't communicate in complex, uh, well, you know, complex is the wrong word there, because just because something communicates differently to us or the same as us, doesn't make it complex or not complex, they fulfill different needs. But because zebras, as far as we know, don't communicate infrasonically, they don't need specialization to their machinery which allowed him to listen to it. So they're very, albeit, I, mean, I don't want to say it, average ears, very average ears. And now all those tails are swishing. One thing that we as um, human beings don't really have tails, unless you're particularly fortunate then you might have a tail. 
or if you're a fetus, you might have a tail. But our need for a tail no longer exists, as the zebras are showing to us very clearly what a tail is very good at, swishing away any pests, any biting flies away from the soft, sensitive areas. Well, if we were living in the bush, wouldn't we still need something to swat away flies from those sensitive areas? No, we wouldn't, because we stand upright and thankfully, our uh, anuses point downwards. They're not exposed in the same way as um, those that walk on all fours are exposed. Hello, mister. Thank you for leaving your vegetation. All that very unforgiving sickle bush around there. Sickle bush is, as the word implies, is the plant that we're seeing in the distance. Very short very very uh, dense, very hard as well, very pokey. Not a nice thing to fall into, not a nice thing to drive into. And there's a lot of it at Madikwe Game Reserve, which is obviously where Tao is located. And they do have the most beautiful flowers, despite my not-so-positive description from earlier. All right, Ellie, it's time for you to have a drink. Or not. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. I thought he was going to stick around, but not. In fact, uh... It's almost as if he heard me and then walked away. Nevertheless, we have another elephant! Yes! Thank you. We are at Oliphant's River now. And we've got this elephants. Ooh, I do love elephants. You know, thinking about the modifications that we do to something that already exists, because pretty much everything that lives on land, um, or all tetrapods, or things that walk on four legs or have four limbs, pretty much have the same body plan. It's just stretched and squashed in different ways to to help us better suit our environment. And I love an elephant's trunk because it is just such an obscurity. Not something we see pretty much anywhere else. And an elephant's trunk is, is the fusion of its upper lip and its nose. And if you grab your nose and your upper lip and you pull them together, imagine that. So a, a great way to kind of figure out how something works is try it for yourself. Or, well, to figure out anything, really. If you see tracks in the sand, walk those tracks. And then think to yourself, what would walk like that? That is how I figured out what a tortoise's track would look like. <laughs> And when I pull my upper lip to my nose, I can very much understand that a, a, an elephant can't suck up water through there, because otherwise it's the same as you sucking water up into your nose. And I almost get a feeling for it. Can you hear that I'm, I'm putting it together? I won't end the show like that. Um, this also reminds me, Mindy did... Uh, so you also just sent through a question as well, but may, or you sent through a comment. You were talking about the elephant at at Tao, and you said, "Wow, if you didn't know better, you would think that that Ellie's natural color was brown, right?" And uh, it was one of my silly questions, I should say, when I just started off as a guide, and I I thought that maybe there's variation in skin color in elephants. You know, I hadn't spent a whole lot of time with elephants previously before becoming a guide. Um, and I had seen a wet elephant, but it was next to a dry elephant, but I'd seen it from a distance. And I was like, wow, how come that elephant is darker? But you're absolutely right, Mindy. You would think that the elephant we saw there at Tao, that its natural color was brown. But the reason I thought of you, Mindy, just now was that you were asking, I think it was you that was asking if there's some kind of um, mechanism that prevents an elephant from you know 
sucking water too far up its trunk uh, and then choking. As far as I could find, I did tell you I'd have a deeper look, as far as I could find, I couldn't find any apparatus like that. The only thing that I, that I did uh, come across was exactly what we spoke about on that day, which is that doesn't, the water cannot travel up high enough for it to enter into the nasal passages of an elephant. Well, that was a, a wonderful time together. A little scattered. We are talking about all sorts of things. Um, I will definitely be having a look at the parrots, Arlene, and of course, Mindy, you've also sent me on a deep dive. And Kaoru, thank you so much. Thank you for your questions and your comments. Remember that Mike Fitz will be joining me for Wild Moments on Thursday, so do come on board too. And then we'll remember to wish you a happy birthday, Rolling Trouble. But from all of us here at Africam and Explore, thank you so much, and I'll see you again soon. Uh, uh, uh.